in Tut. And I'm thrilled to be coordinating the 12 story, uh, the 12 case studies with the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network. Um, welcome to the Anti-Displacement Case Study Spotlight number two. Um, uh, I am Roberto Rodriguez with the National Center for Smart Growth at the University of Maryland. Um, you can find the list of all 12 organizations that are doing these case studies at the link from the SPAN website. Um, and um, it's fantastic to be doing these case studies, accompanying folks from literally throughout the world to see what works in this field. The case studies uh, project began this past summer and will be completed early next fall. When completed, these case studies will be available to all, providing current and timely examples of what tools and strategies work to abate the displacement of small businesses in our communities. This session spotlights four of these organizations that are preparing case studies. We'll be listening and watching in the video in the order of appearance to the Chinatown Community Development Center in San Francisco with Amy Zhu and, and Christy Lee. Then we'll uh, go to Calcutta, India, where uh, Benita Mahatu from Auburn University will present her work. Then we will shift over to uh, London, England, where the Latin elephant community, um, headed up by Santiago Pelufo Soneira, will, will show us what they're doing. And, and we'll conclude with, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Prince will go before Santiago, Prince, uh, Osemwegie from Inclusive Action for uh, the City in LA will be, th will be third in the video, and then we'll go to Santiago. Uh, they will share details of the tools and strategies they're documenting in their community. And this is very critical. They'll also be discussing how others will be able to replicate their work. We'll be showing the video shortly. The video presents all four organizations consecutively. After the video, we'll have representatives from all four organizations with us for the Q&A session, which will be brief. So we actually encourage you to be asking the questions as we go through in the chat and, 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 and to go ahead and do those questions. We'll try to be answering some of them as we go, if not towards the, at the, at the end. So without further ado, let's watch the video and listen to what they have to say. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Zhou, and I'm a planner at Chinatown Community Development Center, known as CCDC, based in San Francisco's Chinatown. This is my colleague, Christy Lee. We're excited to present to you on the Feed and Fuel program run by CCDC at the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network Conference today. So to get started, a little bit of geography about San Francisco Chinatown. Chinatown is located in 20 square blocks in the northeast part of the city, as you can see in the diagram here and is the most densely populated urban area west of Manhattan. It has been an important immigrant gateway during the last 170 plus years and is a critical ecosystem that supports predominantly monolingual immigrant households as they get their start in a new country. It has been known as the initial home for so many that have arrived and made Chinatown the first chapter of their American journey as they continue to rely on the neighborhood for so many aspects of their livelihood, from groceries to healthcare, even community support, and this has kept San Francisco Chinatown as the beating heart of this community. Next up for some demographics, Feed and Fuel Chinatown is a food program that delivers Chinatown restaurant food to the residents, to the res residents living in Chinatown CDC, single room occupancy buildings, also known as SRL buildings. 74% of Chinatown's residents are below HUD's low income limits and many of them live within single room occupancy buildings with units that are usually eight by 10 feet. The working class monolingual residents that reside in the cramped and dilapidated SROs find that these aging units are often in violation of several building and health codes. These units often house one to four people and share a bathroom with 20 to other units, 20 to 40 other units, as well as SROs are considered the housing of last resort, since many of these families also qualify for homeless benefits. Over 500 children live in these SROs, and the average length of the time that families live in one is seven years. For children in SROs, their developmental milestones are similar to those of children living in homeless shelters. 
Data from a 2015 report conducted by SRO Families United Collaborative in San Francisco highlights that the rising number of families residing in SROs is due to the cost of living and lack of affordable housing options available in the city. Many of these residents were deeply impacted by the pandemic as well. As employees in the service sector, 77% of working results adults residing in SROs have lost their jobs since the beginning of the pandemic. Yes, and Chinatown is filled with small businesses, including restaurants, grocers, tourist oriented, and tourist oriented stores filled with trinkets. If you've ever been to Chinatown, you know that Grand Avenue and Stockton Street are the primary quarter of the neighborhood, with Grand being the locus of tourist oriented businesses, and Stockton is home to many of the businesses critical to the lives of residents, including the ones I mentioned before, like the grocery stores, the fishmongers, and the dry goods stores. Based on photographic analysis done by researcher Malcolm Collier, between February 21st and July 30th, 2020, commercial closure or vacancy rose from 7% to 32% on Stockton Street, an increase from 20% to 52% on Grant Street between Grant Avenue between California and Broadway, and from 7% to 75% between Bush and California. Restaurants critical to the first iteration of the Feed and Fuel program were surveyed just after the pandemic began. And we found that in spring 2020, the average Chinatown restaurant lost 70% of their business as referenced in the pie graph here. The major core challenges that Chinatown continues to deal with are twofold. First is recovery from COVID-19. The Chinatown community has dealt with multiple COVID-19 shutdowns, anti-Asian hate, and the increasing cost of living expenses in San Francisco. COVID-19 has been very difficult for multiple small businesses in Chinatown. Many have shuttered due to difficulties during the pandemic, and many merchants experienced drastic decreases from the loss of business. Secondly, are these displacement pressures? For example, the Chinatown Central Subway will be opening in the next year, which means big changes that could spell out gentrification and displacement. Small businesses around the Central Subway have already been impacted by the construction. Approximately 80 to 100 small businesses were impacted by street shutdowns, dust and noise, power disruptions, and flooding of replacement. So to address the impacts of COVID, but also the significant concerns around displacement, CCDC ran the Feed and Fuel program. Starting in 2020, shortly after the shutdown, Feed and Fuel provided meals and meal vouchers to extremely low-income families living in SF Chinatown SRO buildings. These families received hot, prepared, culturally appropriate meals from local restaurants, reducing their need to use communal kitchens during COVID. In addition, these local restaurants were supported and were able to keep local residents employed. In Feed and Fuel, and Feed and Fuel addressed displacement anti-displacement, supporting residents and supporting small businesses that provide affordable services to these low-income families. And with that, we conclude our presentation. Please let us know if you have any questions and thanks for listening. Hello everyone. My name is Benita Mahato and I am an assistant professor in the community planning program which is housed in the political science department at Auburn University. So the case study I'm going to present today is about formalization of the informal sector through hawkers unions. And this is a part of my dissertation as well an ongoing study um, that I have been doing while I was in University of Cincinnati. Um, one of my colleagues there, Arindam Roy, is also a part of this project uh, as part of the SBAN uh, grant. So moving forward, um, this um, case study is about the ways uh, informal sectors have been trying to formalize themselves to uh, protect themselves from displacement. And the study I'm doing is located in Kolkata in the state of West Bengal in India. So if you are not familiar where, of where West Bengal is, it is in the eastern part of India, as you can see in the map. And the city itself is a city and a district. To give you an idea of the city itself, uh, the city is around 72 square miles, um, but the metropolitan area is huge. It's about 729 square miles. You can also see that the city population is around 4.5 million. Uh, the metropolitan uh, population is around 14 million. The city is extremely dense. Um, you can see that around, um, 
62,000 people live in one square mile. So that's a huge uh, amount. Uh, also, what is more interesting and what makes Kolkata a, a, a perfect city to study the formalization of the informal sector is that almost 22% of the city's population live in informal sector like the slums. Um, almost 19% of the population are below poverty, 20% of them are unemployed. Um, and more, most interestingly, uh, if you look at the demographic of all the workers, around 52% of the workers are migrant workers who come from the neighboring countries like Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh. Um, and almost 65% of them will stay in the city for 10 or more years. So what happens is that of India's total economic, almost 80% of them are employed through these informal sector. And this is largely constituted by immigrant workers, like I said. And uh, if you look at the different types of informal sectors, this include informal economic activities, including hawking and vending in public spaces, such as squares, streets, or sidewalks. So on the right-hand side, I have few pictures taken from uh, Kolkata sidewalks, and you can see these are the shops that these migrant workers um, have in place in the city. So what happened over the time? Um, in 1990s, um, the city and the police itself, they, um, they employed uh, several spatial purification movements, as they call them, to um, dislocate, displace these informal hawkers to make the city, you know, as they say, beautiful and mostly catering to upper classes. But what happened that these informal workers, they started to protest against that and um, created these hawkers unions as a form to make themselves more um, formalized in the city system. So uh, since 1990s, we saw a surge of hawkers unions uh, that came into being and they were protected by the, uh, the Central Trade Union Organization, which was established originally by the Trade Union Act of India uh, in 1926. So what we see is that in later time in 2014, the Street Vendors Act of India was, was the more formalized way of um, making street vending legal in India. So these hawkers unions, they are bottom up um, organizations. They are formed by the geographic locations of hawking and vending and are laid by the informal workers of the area. Uh, we also see that the Labor Department of the Government of West Bengal, they endorse and manage the, the, these unions. Um, today in Kolkata, uh, there are around 6,000 trade unions and 119 hawkers unions. Uh, and most of them were formed by the Hawker Shangram Committee, which came into being as a, as a, uh, for the protest against the 1997 Operation Sunshine, one of the brutal spatial purification movements that occurred in Kolkata. So what we can see, there is a National Hawker Federation, which was formed by Hawker Shangram Committee. Um, Hawker Shangram Committee is also a part of it, and under which we have several hawkers unions, and then uh, each union will have several street hawkers. So for this study, what we're trying to look is how, uh, what are the challenges historically faced by informal workers uh, and how um, they have been addressed by HSC and uh, in what ways. We also want to know what are the current challenges faced by informal workers. Um, also, you know, what are their uh, ways of resolving current issues and how in macro and micro levels these organizations work. So at macro level, which is the level of Hawker Shangram Committee, we want to know about their formation, operation, legitimacy, funding outcomes, limitation, and future. 
And same for the micro level, uh, we want to know these for the individual unions. So, so far we have conducted um, uh, interviews with five Hawker Sangram committee members, uh, 11 union leaders and about 50 hawkers. And this is a picture of me, uh, one of the interview sessions that I had in Kolkata. Um, thank you so much for listening. And uh, if you have any question, you can email it back to me. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Prince Osungi. I'm a policy associate over at Clusa Fashion for the city. Today, I'm going to be speaking to you about our S-Band case study entitled CORE, or Community-Owned Real Estate. So before jumping into our actual case study, let me give you a little background information on my organization. Inclusive Action for the City is a Los Angeles-based community development financial institution whose mission is to bring people together to build a strong local economy that uplifts communities through advocacy and transform transformative economic development initiatives. Inclusive action, we support local small businesses in two fronts. First, we address immediate needs by providing direct services such as microfinancing, business coaching, and technical assistance. On the longer end front, we do policy research and advocacy to ensure that we're also making sure local governments address the needs of local small businesses in our communities. Now jumping into our case study entitled CORE, uh, Community-Owned Real Estate. First off, let me context set here of actually defining what we mean by community-owned. When we say community-owned, we are referring to mission-driven organizations serving as stewards of community assets. In this case, it's commercial real estate. So ultimately what CORE is for us is a mission-driven commercial real estate venture um, partnership that formed in 2019 between three different community-based organizations in Los Angeles. Inclusive Action, my organization, East LA Co Community Corporation, and Little Tokyo Service Center. Our primary goal of CORE is to preserve local small businesses that are vulnerable to displacement and gentrification pressures, such as market speculation, rising rent, and property costs. So our short-term short goal is to acquire and rehab commercial properties to hold them in our commercial real estate portfolio in perpetuity. Our long-term goal, not to add a benefit of a project, is to provide tenants the opportunity to take ownership or equity in our core project portfolio. So diving into a little bit of neighborhood context here and neighbor, where we're based is we're based in a community called um, Boyle Heights. Our core project actually services and spans between two different neighborhoods, Boyle Heights and East LA. Uh, it's five properties spread across these two neighborhoods. And as said before, we have three partners that are managing this portfolio and own it. In these five properties, and collectively, we have room and space for 23 tenants in which as of today, we have 20 tenants occupying these spaces. Jumping into a little bit of neighborhood context in terms of residents serving there in Boyle Heights is, one, it's important to note that it's um, one of the fifth largest neighborhoods in Los Angeles, so represents a lot of people. Uh, number two, it's, it's predominantly Latino uh, community, representing about 91% of the population there, but historically it was Japanese and Jewish neighborhood. The medium household income is about 45,000, with 22% of the residents living below the poverty line. And also important to note is 75% of this community is also um, richer occupied, meaning that on both the commercial real estate front and residential front, both, uh, both stakeholders are very vulnerable to being displaced if the property owner decides to sell or increase the rent. When looking at the businesses in the community itself, one is important to note that the commercial property values in Boyle Heights have, ha, has appreciated 20% higher than neighboring communities since 20, 2006 to 2021. 
Second, the community is dominated by manufacturing jobs representing 15% of the business sector there, followed by retail or storefront representing 13%. And then the medium home price is about 680,000. So there's three challenges impacting small businesses in the neighborhood right now. Number one, first and foremost, is gentrification pressures. By that, we mean rising property values, rising rent, and new, new emerging non-local businesses that are disconnected from the community. Number two is access to capital. Um, for both residents and also small businesses themselves, this community is relatively underbanked, and there's a prevalence of predatory lenders such as payday. And then number three is just overall representation. By that, we're, it's important to pay homage to history that this also is a historically red line community and was neglected by both the public and private sector. Um, as of today, some of the needs of the residents are still re relatively overlooked. And there's also a lack of disconnect between, um, connection between this um, public stakeholders uh, who can make the decisions and the community at large. So with our core project, what we're trying to do is address a lot of the challenges laid out by four different ways. First and foremost, we're, this is ultimately a mission-driven commercial real estate acquisition um, project in which we're trying to take speculative property off the market and hold them in per perpetuity to offer and lease spaces to local business owners and micro entrepreneurs at an affordable rate um, that's below market prices. Number two, we want to make sure that in addition to providing affordable rent to small businesses, we also want to make sure that we provide holistic support such as technical assistance. And by technical assistance, we mean business coaching, financial literacy, credit counseling, business plan reviews, business incubation, technological services support, and loan and grant application assistance. Also, it's important to note that we cap our rent increases at 3%. And for future tenants, let's say if a tenant moves out, uh, we also guarantee that we're not going to float the rates back up the market, right? Um, when, third, it's important to note, um, another strategy in this project is also strategic community partners. Um, as said before, uh, we have a partnership with two other organizations, and we are really strategic in making sure that, number one, they're community-oriented, and they have a, um, roots and connections within the communities that we're um, buying property in. And number two, we want to make sure our skill sets between the organizations are spread out. So we have expertise ranging from tenant case management, small business technical assistance, and then also real estate development. And this is important to ensure to longevity and sustainability of the project. And then number um, four, ultimately what we're building upon and looking to explore deeper with this case study is seeking to make sure this project is scalable and we actually provide a meaningful way for our tenants today to take ownership uh, in, the in the real estate portfolio, whether it's through equity or share of um, the revenue that's generated from it. We're looking at developing a approach mechanism for core tenants to have a stake in the project itself. With that said, I would like to thank Espen for giving us this opportunity to present here today and um, doing this great work in cultivating the space to bring like-minded organizations and individuals together. Thank you very much. And have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at Inclusive Action. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Santiago Pelufo Soneida. I am our work we had some questions everything the past eight years in just about five minutes but i'll do my best um i will discuss the retention growth and sustainability of london's latin barrio 
Um, and uh, I will begin by introducing very briefly the charity. So we are Latin Elephant, a registered charitable organization uh, with the Charity Commission of England and Wales, set up in 2014 with the objective of promoting participation and social inclusion of racialized communities in processes of urban change in London, in particular among Latin Americans. We have three main areas of work, research and advocacy, business supports and community engagements. You can see um, the map of Greater London uh, and where the borough and specifically Elephant and Castle where we operate is. So you can see hopefully very, very close to the River Thames, so very, very central. And you'll see why that's important in terms of um, location and, and land value. Uh, yes. So we operate, the community, the Latin American community operates in the London borough of Southwark, one of the 32 uh, boroughs in London. It's one of the most densely populated, not just in London, but overall in the UK and one of the most diverse so 48 percent perceive themselves as what we call in the uk black asian minority ethnic i believe in the us is bipoc 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 um and it's way the average way above the average of london and the uk uh, it's one of the most sadly one of the most deprived areas um both in london and in the uk and where the majority uh, of the Latin Americans in the UK and in London in particular live or with over 10% of the Latin Americans. That's the census of 10 years ago. So we believe that number is probably higher and the um, increase in the population with the uh, successive uh, waves of migration, especially coming from Spain. So the picture that you see is what was the up until 2020 september 2020 the uh elephant castle shopping center the first covered uh mall in europe built in 1965 sadly demolished in 2020 and where the we identified our research identified over 26 language uh, languages spoken and where the small independent businesses uh, uh, have been trading for many, many years, some of them uh, an average of over 15, but some of them with family business with over 25 years, 80% um, of whom uh, identify themselves as belonging to a Black Asian minority ethnic background. Um, so you can imagine how much attachments to the area they had and continue to have, because we'll see now how the relocation sort of unfolded. These are some of the beautiful um, beneficiaries and members of our community that we uh, represent and work alongside and places where we hang out, have lunch. Uh, you can see uh, barbers, uh, bakeries, uh, tailors, local radio, restaurants, and, and, and so on. Uh, very diverse uh, from very, 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 very diverse um, places of the world uh, among Latin America. And these are the, the plans that developers Delancey with the local authorities of their council have been submitting to, to, since 2016, um, a time when we um, started partnering with our local organizations to campaign representing the needs uh, and the will of the local independent businesses that were going to be displaced. Um, there were a series of planning applications. Uh, we managed to secure several amendments and several new versions of the plan until it was approved in uh, July 2018, further uh, later on approved by the Mayor of London in December 2018. And then um, we have been um, continue the campaign uh, as to the retention of these businesses with many of the uh, amendments uh, in place in the application um, and you see that there's a lot of uh, you know at least six proposed uh, high rise um, buildings that mainly uh, will house luxury accommodation not retail and this is kind of the main disputes in the application um, so as I said, the main challenge, one of the main challenges is the commercial displacement of the mainly the Latin American but other uh, racialized communities in this area in particular that were further impacted by COVID, later Brexit, and most recently the cost of living. 
um, we have faced uh, some unfair tactics by developers, that even though they have to abide to the Section 106, which is the contract they signed with the local authority. These have not been met in full, so that's why we continue campaigning and advocating for the rights of the local vendors. We have faced, sadly, some lack of support from the local councillors. At times, some support, but more often, a lack of support. And the loss of the shopping centre meant a loss of visibility in an area that was, and still is a landmark, as the Latin Barrio, the Latin Quarter, um, mainly due to the lack of footfall, uh, because the, um, the, the loss of the shopping centre meant the loss of uh, a lot of the anchor businesses they used to attract, not, not, not to mention the, 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 the loss of the bingo, the bowling alley, uh, and an informal community centre, which is the, the main kind of social loss in this case. We have tried and we continue to try to tackle these challenges by campaigning, not just on the streets, but also big social media presence, partner with local groups that have more expertise on the legal side of things, on the housing, and our local residents have seen many of these developments fail and we are continue to learn from those experiences. As I said, heavy uh, um, focus on research and advocacy. We have produced several reports on social and economic value of the area, uh, some lessons learned, and our vision for London's Latin Quarter, which still is our main um, planning um, document. Um, these processes uh, you know, have a focus with the knowledge sharing by which the local vendors uh, share their knowledge with us. And together, in a very horizontal approach, we present this evidence uh, to the local authority and we uh, work very, very close with the community, mainly with a multidisciplinary approach, having a spectrum of uh, skills and, and uh, professional backgrounds, architects, social media experts, uh, local residents, housing experts, uh, journalists, uh, urban planners, and the like. We have secured the relocation for many businesses that were going to be displaced. Uh, in the map, we're trying to show the relocation spaces, which happen to be two or three minute walking distance from the old shopping center. So this, this is you know, partly a success of the campaign. And you will see in the graph on the right, uh, a relocation fund that did not exist to pay for the compensation of that displacement, and a cap in the rent for one of the uh, temporary relocation sites, um, a significant increase in the amount of social housing as part of the campaign, that was not in place in the original document by the developers. A 10% affordable retail space in the new development, whenever that's built, estimated 2025, 2026, plus a further cap in the rent for years six to 15. So these are some of the gains that we had in this long uh, campaign. So if you have any questions, hopefully I have covered most of the topics, but I'm sure these, uh, will um, prompt some more questions, happy to take them. So thank you very much. Well, th this is simply amazing. And thank you guys uh, for having video recorded that. Um, I, I, I did want to announce with folks that we're going to go uh, a tad late on this session. We're going to go uh, to about 30 after the hour because we want to bring on live the the four organizations that we just saw and and ask them each to 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 join us in in basically this there's been some questions that we've been answering on the uh, uh on the chat but but um we want to give them each the opportunity to to in a closure statement speak to to the following after listening to your peers and the work they're doing what what might you want to share here live with the other participants of this session? So um, I, I and I think the simplest way is to to go in the way that we appeared on the video. So um, I, I'd like to ask um, Amy and Christy if if you could uh, to to answer that question first. Uh. 
Um, I mean, where to begin? Like, there's so much amazing information that was shared by the peers, I think, in the last session that we just saw. And I'm very struck by the ways in which physical space is so critically important to so many small businesses. And I think our program was a little bit different in that it was really like, these are all businesses that were already situated in brick and mortars and we're supporting the ones that were already there. But especially in Santiago, your presentation and talking about the, uh, the necessary assistance that comes in relocation before COVID happened. Um, uh, well, actually not even before COVID, 20 years before the first effort to get the central subway to Chinatown began and it's finally opening in Chinatown in like in January. So it's been over 20 years. And of course, over the course of that period of this massive infrastructure project, there have been multiple small businesses that needed to be relocated, including some of the ones who were in our feed and fuel program. So one of the things that we're really interested in exploring as well is like how have these businesses who are relocated and then hit with that double whammy of COVID-19 be able to survive and been able to actually thrive post-COVID. So um, it's just really wonderful, I think, being in this space and having these conversations and listening to them. Um, can, can, can we uh, um, break the order here? Because uh, Santiago, can, can, can you go next, please? Since, and, and, and just again, um, what is uh, uh, your reaction of what you may want to share with everybody now that you've heard your peers? Uh, yes, thank you, Roberto. And yeah, Amy, your question is, your comments is very pertinent in that the physical space is uh, increasingly uh, shrinking, um, sadly, uh, in, in our case, and I think most of the cases of other um, cities and communities that have been struggling with similar issues. Um, and, and on top of that, that's why I refer to an ongoing campaign and, and movement, because you know, the pandemic and Brexit and so many other maybe more European issues. Which I think the war in Ukraine is, is, is you know, impacting in the world, but it's more felt in, in Europe, um, have, have put even more challenges. So it's it's about uh, being reactive to, to, to these circumstances. And, and as I said, uh, thankfully, we have a multidisciplinary team that we can, um, you know, assist the community. Uh, so we continue to do research on, on these further impacts, not just on the loss of the physical space, which is key, but sadly not the, the only one. Okay. And, and Santiago, you, you, you invoked the, the need for research. And I think in, in some cases, I think Venita is, is doing that in depth. Um, so now, Venita, will, will you share where, what, uh, what you'd like others to know, given what you've heard from your peers, please? Well, it was really very informative, all of your presentations, and I really enjoyed them because I found that there are so many similarities between, you know, uh, in, with, between, uh, in the issues that we are all trying to uh, learn about or trying to provide answers for. One of the things that I found is really a common thing um, is uh, definitely COVID-19. Um, even in India, it impacted the small businesses a lot to, compared to other uh, formal businesses. Um, and one of the things that um, when, while I was doing the interviews they talked about is to have the rights uh, as other shop owners or retailers who could borrow money from you know banks and other places to you know start with the capital and survive during the pandemic uh, years which i found is really a challenge because they are they are not considered as businessmen yet you know like business people yet um, because they are informal in nature although they now have uh, ids and everything and they have license to rent and shop but still there's so much more to do and i guess um uh, all of your examples are show like there's so many ways this could be done and the unions still need to do a lot to make make their um you know, their members more stabilized um, in the city. Yeah. 
of this. And 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 Prince, how do you um, how do you see some of the commonalities? Uh, what, what do you, what are some of the commonalities that you see amongst um, the, the four organizations that just presented, but uh, as you get to know the other folks that are doing case studies and so, and, and, and in, in this line of work, what are the commonalities that you'd like to share with, with uh, the, the participants after listening to, to your peers? Hey everyone, great question. And um, just wanna say real fast, great. It was an amazing presentation from everyone. And I was really excited to hear a lot about the other case studies. What became apparent to me was a lot, as a lot of people have known it already, was uh, just overall impact of COVID-19. No one could have expected that to um, impact businesses the way they have been, even though like we have like kind of quote unquote, open up the doors again. and businesses are allowed to have people inside. There's still a lot of relics um, that have only acerbated like existing conditions and carry on today that have been impacting small businesses. Um, so for me, like in addition to COVID-19, another common theme I've seen that has been known as well was also just the need for overall land itself. Um, fortunately, like land is still seen as like a investment vehicle a lot. So what that looks like for the stakeholders who are path bias, they often get pushed out and there just needs to be more access to affordable land. That's like either community owned or controlled in some capacity. And then the fourth common, um, third common thing I also saw was just like more access to capital, being able to buy uh, land or buy other resources much needed. And then fourth, I would say just overall representation. Like, I you know, uh, Benita, you mentioned like the sidewalk vendors and like India and stuff and similar issues. My organization is well known for sidewalk any advocacy. We just passed the state bill SB 972. Um, be more happy to share resources on that after this. But it's just the overall representation of getting like people with power to see that, hey, these people are business owners as well. They also deserve a lot of rights that, you know, you might give the brick and mortars as well. So I would say overall, those are four common themes I saw across the board. Great. Well, this is, I mean, I I, I could continue listening to y'all in, uh, in a free form conversation. I wish we had the time. Uh, if you want to continue some of this conversation, those are in, within the conference space, if you will, there is the um, case studies community board and there is a uh, case study spotlight uh, from yesterday named keep talking and if you go there you'll see some of uh, yesterday's comments plus plus you can add uh, add your own i do want to uh, do the impossible which is in 10 seconds um uh, kind of like wrap this up and and th think what what we all heard you uh, exclaim is this um, th these commonalities of, uh, look, got to have capital. Number two, you, we, we're in the world of, of COVID very much still, and it's, uh, and it's aftermath. Um, three, you got to do your research. Um, four, I mentioned first, was physical space. And I just do want to, uh, uh, just an observation of all, all the, the, the four, organizations that are listed here today and, and others that ultimately it is the people that make the place and all too often that's capitally driven reversed uh, of making a place for certain people and so it is the people that make the place and so so I just just want to thank you profoundly I um, uh, I, I know the, the, the intensity of the work y'all are doing and to and to our participants, please if you try to keep the conversation going by going going over to the keep talking uh, case study spotlight, and and to everyone, please remember this conference ain't over yet. There's a, a couple of, of amazing events coming up, including if you're in a rush rush, I believe there's one more meditation left. So so hopefully we'll see you in some of those networking sessions. Um, and 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 thank you all. This is amazingly fantastic. And with that. Please take a break and go to your uh, whatever next session you want. And to the participants, thank you. And to the panelists, thank you, guys. Gracias. Adios.